tonight. So thanks, thanks very much, Scott, for agreeing to do this presentation. Look forward to hearing it. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Wayne. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, some of you might remember several years ago now, I did a presentation on some of the technology from the Apollo program. And a lot of the stuff that uh, allows our society to function today actually came from Apollo technology. And there were, I don't know, some 30 or 40 um, uh, ideas and technologies from Apollo that we just take for granted today. One thing I didn't talk about was the Apollo computer. So I thought I'd fill in that hole and uh, talk about uh, the Apollo computer today. I was just queuing the presentation up. No, I'll tell you. Uh, okay. Can you all actually? I'll just. Uh, no, you. I can't. You get. You, we only had part of it. Just. Uh, let's try this one. I was going to share a presentation. You yeah, just put it into the normal mode. Yep. Get this one. Okay. All right. That's good. Now I'm going to uh, read off a script here. So my apologies if I turn away from the camera uh, from time to time. Okay, so the talk today is about the Apollo guidance computer. And the picture here is um, on the left-hand side, the actual Apollo guidance computer. And on the right-hand side, a little device called the uh, DISKY, D-S-K-Y, which is the interface that the astronauts used to talk to the Apollo guidance computer. The Apollo guidance computer, or AGC, took man from Earth orbit to the lunar landing and back to Earth. It operated flawlessly. It was designed and built when computer program did not technically exist. Integrated circuits were a side curiosity and equivalent computers were the size of a room. The AGC had to be smaller than one cubic foot, operate within extremely limited computer memory and be able to operate flawlessly using technologies never before used and make complex orbital computations in an environment where circuitry had never been uh, before asked to operate. All designed, built, programmed, tested, and delivered within five years. The AGC was ahead of its time with computing concepts that we take for granted today, either created or refined during its design and development. For the first time, lives were in the hands of a computer. There was no direct IT support, although mission control was, the end, was at the end of a phone. There was no replacement parts. There was no tolerance for failure. The AGC program had to manage all foreseen eventualities and be flexible enough to manage contingencies and disasters, both external and internal to the AGC itself. The AGC was flying to the moon and negotiating gravitational wells, landing on the moon and then returning to lunar orbit and attempting to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere at searing temperatures with really very little room for error. When Apollo 11 touched down on the Sea of Tranquility on July 20, 1969, it was more than a triumph of the human spirit. It was also the story of a cybernetic wonder called the Apollo Guidance Computer which helped the Apollo astronauts safely navigate to the moon and back. It was a computer so advanced for its time that the engineers who created it said they probably wouldn't have tried to do so if they had known what they were getting themselves into. The Apollo guidance computer is one of the unsung success stories of the space race. This is probably because it was so phenomenally successful, having had very few in-flight problems, and those were due to human error. Carried aboard both the command service module and the lunar module, it flew on 15 manned missions, including nine moon flights, six lunar landings, three Skylab missions, and the Apollo Soyuz test mission in 1975. After Apollo, the AGC was used to control the US Air Force F-8 Crusader jet fighter and the US Navy Deep Submergence Rescue Vehicle. At the time, it was the latest and most advanced fly-by-wire and inertial guidance system, the first digital flight computer, the most advanced miniature computer to date, uh, the first computer to use silicon chips, and the first onboard computer where the lives of crew depended on it functioning as advertised. 
not, the, not that the AGC was much to look at. At first glance, it appeared like a brass suitcase in two parts, measuring a total of 61 by 32 by 17 centimetres and weighing in at 32 kilograms. Inside, it isn't even very impressive by modern computer standards, having about as much oomph as a smart light bulb with a total of about 38K of memory and a 12 microsecond clock speed. It was also hard to make accurate comparison with modern devices because the AGC wasn't a general purpose, uh, purpose computer, but one that was literally hardwired for a particular task, which allowed it to perform at the level of a Commodore 64 or a ZX Spectrum of the early 1980s. But try to imagine getting to, to the moon using a Commodore 64 to handle the navigation, the navigation and not break into a cold sweat. In many ways, the concepts created to build the software and hardware for the AGC in the early 1960s led to concepts still used today in Windows-based laptops. So what we're gonna talk about today is uh, the AGC history, the AGC design and specifications, making an AGC, uh, programming the AGC, uh, its responsibilities in an Apollo mission, uh, highlights of the Apollo missions, where the AGC shone, and what makes the AGC truly incredible. Now that uh, diagram you can see there uh, is a simplification of going to the moon and back uh, with the uh, launch from the Earth uh, to the moon uh, with the orbit of the moon through a typical Apollo program and then now, the landing on the moon and then finally leaving the moon again, rendezvous in uh, lunar orbit, and then the uh, trans-Earth trajectory back to Earth and the uh, splashdown in the ocean. So pretty much all of that was under the control of the AGC. Okay, just a bit of the history. Where did the AGC computer come from? In many respects, it came from the Polaris missile program and surprisingly, NASA's 1950s plan for unmanned survey trips to Mars. Polaris formed the background, backbone of the US Navy's nuclear force. Development of the inertial guidance system advanced during the Polaris program uh, as the launch site, uh, let's say ships, had to contend with movement of the sea, which made accurate targeting very complex. This experience gained within MIT became invaluable when designing the systems of the Apollo program, including the AGC. The AGC project kicked off in 1961 with a one-page specification from NASA. The integrated circuit had been invented only two years earlier. The AGC was used until 1975. There were no in-flight errors ever attributed to software errors, none. Try and design a system today with zero software errors. Okay, the uh, AGC design and specifications. This diagram is um, the AGC box uh, unscrewed. And it's actually two separate boxes that are screwed together. So you can see the two halves of the AGC here. And each one of those sections is a uh, computer logic module uh, that um, addressed a certain part of the uh, AGC's functionality. Managing the astronauts display and controls was a difficult task for the digital computer. Computers at the time were not user friendly and had demonstrated an inclination to fail. Nobody had confidence that a digital computer could complete an Apollo mission without failure. The decision to use any integrated circuits in the AGC was a very difficult decision. Hardware designers did not want to use unreliable and immature technology uh, with only one supplier being Fairchild in the whole industry. The physical appearance of the Apollo guidance computer compared to its chronological peers is very underwhelming. Utterly silent and lacking any indication of its purpose, the AGC can be easily overlooked. Uh, and just uh, to show you a little bit about what those modules look like, 
On the left hand side, about two thirds of the way down, there's one that says power supply. And that is a power supply module from an AGC. I was hoping to actually show this to you in the Powerhouse Museum, but uh, a very heavy beast. And on the back, you can see it's just solid resin to make the, uh, the whole module uh, space worthy. So it didn't shake apart in space. The AGC itself has a simple packaging system. The computer circuits were in two trays consisting of 24 modules. Tray A held the logic circuits, interfaces and power supply. And what you saw then was a power supply. Tray B held the memory, memory electronics, analog alarm devices, and the clock, which had a speed of one megahertz. The AGC interface with many internal and external devices and operations as shown in this diagram. The AGC could communicate with 150 different devices within the spacecraft, an enormously complex task. So if you look at this diagram, the AGC itself is the, the central section um, with the computer and the box above is the DISCI, which is the, uh, the thing that the astronauts use to communicate with the AGC. Uh, and on the right hand side are the various uh, links uh, to uh, various controls within the spacecraft itself. And uh, down the bottom where it says optical subsystems, uh, that was basically the, um, the hardware used to navigate the Apollo spacecraft. So here's another diagram of the AGC uh, interfacing to uh, its various uh, subsystems and the spacecraft itself. The AGC interface with the Apollo's inertial systems or gyros and the optics system via the coupling data units. These units functioned as analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters. The inertial measurement unit, and if you look on the left-hand side, you can see a device that says optics and the bottom half of that is the IMU. The IMU was the stable platform for, uh, of reference for the spacecraft. It included uh, rate integrating gyros and accelerometers. So gyroscopes, et cetera, were in there and that's what helped determine the position of the Apollo craft. The optics system had a sextant and scanning telescope. It used the stars as a fixed point of reference. So the um, uh, the AGC knew at all times where it was compared to where it was supposed to be. The method of human communication with the AGC was through a unit that was like a simple keyboard and a very primitive visual display. This was the uh, DISCI, and this would be described in a few minutes. The DISCI itself is in this diagram, top centre, uh, the nav panel DISCI. And DISCI is, uh, is not a monomic, it just stands for display and keyboard. To accommodate the commands of the astronauts, the interface uh, with the DISCI was in the form of verbs and nouns. Verbs signified actions and nouns the data items. And I'll go through uh, how this worked again in a few minutes. The stabilization and control systems included a series of thrusters to adjust the spacecraft's attitude based on computer derived or manual entry commands. The LEM had both an AGC and a separate abort guidance system computer or J AGSC. If the primary guidance computer or the AGC failed during lunar descent, the AGSC could be used to return the LEM to a safe lunar orbit and await rendezvous by the command module. The abort system was not capable of completing a lunar landing. Now this is actually important uh, for uh, Apollo 14, for instance. What I just said there is if there was a problem either with the landing itself or the AGC at the time of landing, a second computer could uh, take control uh, of the, uh, the LEM and return it back into orbit and wait till the command module came around to pick it up. Uh, the problem that they had with the Apollo 14 was there was a loose piece of solder inside the computer and they were very concerned that if that loose piece of solder touched a few 
components while they were landing, the AGC would detect a fault condition and automatically uh, call an abort, and Apollo 14 would have uh, would have essentially aborted. Uh, so there was an interesting workaround to uh, to stop the abort uh, program from being initiated. Okay, the design and specifications tasks of the AGC included radar data processing, calculation of orbit parameters, computation of rendezvous sequences, calibration of IMU sensors, that's the, uh, the gyros, engine commands, external signal sampling, attitude control, uh, IMU signal processing, update of the primary guidance and navigation control system, downlink data and update of direction cosines. That's uh, trigonometric uh, calculations for navigation. Now I said all of that because all of that capability was housed within the extremely limited memory. You can see here that the AGC had only 2K of RAM and 36K of ROM. All of that functionality was within that memory. The AG AGC software engineers, headed by Margaret Hamilton, grew, grew to a team of 350 people. They created the concept of interpreter, and interpreters are still used in today's computers. There was, there was a concept created for the AGC, which allowed the computer to run five to seven programs simultaneously all within the two kilobytes of uh, RAM memory. So this computer was able to run five to seven programs at the same time. It was multitasking, which was uh, a superb idea uh, at the time. The 2K of RAM contained the operating system, process management, AGC recovery processes, and the global variables for all mission phases. 2K of RAM, that's it crammed into this tiny memory were dedicated memory areas used by application programs, the software that performed the guidance and navigation tasks, including tasks for landing on the moon and lunar orbit rendezvous. Programs were each allowed a whopping seven words of memory for temporary var variables. That's seven bytes, not seven kilobytes, seven bytes of memory. When we talk about the power of the AGC, people like to make uh, the comparisons that a digital watch has more power than the Apollo computer, but the watch is not more capable than the AGC. The AGC landed men on the moon within 500 to 600 feet of the target after traveling a quarter of a million miles from Earth and landed at a velocity of less than one tenth of a foot per second. Try getting your watch to do that. Memory hardware uh, of the AGC. The requirements for memory were probably the most difficult to estimate for the AGC. NASA and its contractors were consistently unable to make adequate judgments in this area. The AGC had both permanent and erasable memory, that's the RAM and the ROM, which grew rapidly in size during the design period. The original MIT design assumed that 4,000 words of fixed memory and 256 words of erasable memory would be enough. The fixed memory assumption jumped from 4K to 10K to 12K, 24K, and then finally 36K. Lack of memory caused problems for the software with functions needed to be created for the software for orbital and flight calculations. Some functions were dropped due to lack of memory. If the original designers had known about this problem, um, the AGC would have used a 24-bit word rather than the 16-bit to increase the memory allocation addressing capability. The AGC was being developed at a time when not only computers, but the entire field of electronics was undergoing an astonishing evolution that no one could predict. And it wasn't just computing technologies that were advancing while the AGC was being designed and built. Basic electronics were as well. 
In the late 1940s, transistors replaced radio valves and the printed circuit board was conquering the old wire and solder circuit boards. But both of these were threatened by the integrated circuit, uh, the direct ancestor to the silicon chip that hit the scene in 1958. It's about three years before the AGC was spec'd. This caused no end of trouble for the AGC. How do you design a computer that won't fly for six years when the technology keeps changing? Worse, how do you get industry support for a computer that has to remain in production and in use for 10 years when the industry expects everything to change within 18 months? It did not encourage confidence at the time. It was into this maelstrom that MIT fell in August 1961, remember that date, 1961, when NASA decided to award the Apollo guidance computer contract um, to the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory instead of the agency's usual supplier, which was IBM. This was in large part because MIT, under Instrumentation Laboratory head Charles Draper, had a strong track record in developing inertial guidance systems with Eldon C. Hall designing the latest uh, for the US Navy's Polaris missile computer, as I mentioned before. The big hurdle was that the specification for the AGC was a blank sheet of paper. No one had built anything like this and no one had any idea of how to go about it. So as a starting point, MIT fell back on a four volume Mars mission study from 1958 that postulated an unmanned 150 kilogram Mars probe that could navigate autonomously using star fixes as it did a flyby of the red planet, took photographs and then looped back to Earth for recovery. It was a very long way from something suitable for manned lunar manding, but it was a start. Soon the basic design began to emerge of a small self-contained low powered general computer that could handle all the navigation problems of a moon voyage. Based on the technology from the Polaris missile, it will use a gyroscope and accelerometers combined with a sextant to fix the position of the spacecraft and keep it on course. Beyond this, the new computer would have to conform to general Apollo specifications. It had to be rugged enough to withstand spaceflight and use a minimum number of transistors, which were still unreliable. In addition, it needed a simple control interface for the astronauts. Though the engineers would have preferred uh, the crew to just go along for the ride and not interfere with the AGC at all. Design of the system began in the second quarter of 1961, and NASA installed a block, block one or early design AGC version in a spacecraft in September 1965. And just think of that, that's four years to design the computer, create new technologies and software and hardware, and have a working mock-up version, the block one design, and install in a spacecraft. That's a phenomenally short period of time. Release of the original software named Corona was in January 1966 with the first flight in August 1966. Less than three years after that, so three years after the first operational AGC was installed, the designers achieved the program directive based on President Kennedy's speech, I land a man on the moon. These are incredibly short time periods we're talking about. Even though fewer than two dozen spacecraft flew, NASA authorized the building of 75 AGC computers and 138 diskies, as some craft had two diskies on board. 57 of the AGC and 102 of the diskies were built in the Block 2 design, which is the final design used for all the manned um, missions. Raytheon chose to build the AGC that um, MIT had designed and never built a computer as complex as the AGC. The production line within Raytheon increased from 800 to 2,000 staff over one year. 
It seemed like a promising start, but it didn't last. By 1966, MIT was obviously in way over uh, its head and NASA sent in a troubleshooter named Bill Tyndall. These lengthy yet blunt missives outlined how MIT was suffering from not being a proper contractor and didn't have the requisite culture or discipline for a job like the AGC. The result was a slow progress and needless duplication in the software, which is full of bugs and took up too much memory. But not all of the, all of the problems were organisational. In 1966, Software was a new word and many computer professionals had trouble understanding the concept of software. In fact, no one was exactly certain what a computer could, exa could actually do. What were its strengths? What were its weaknesses? It was literally learn as you go. One of the lessons that MIT learned was that the technology was still too primitive for the machine that uh, had envisaged. By 1966, it was clear that the AGC was uh, just too small with not enough memory, was too slow to handle enough tasks at one time, and couldn't handle the uh, data the way analog circuits could. The development of the AGC had many issues to contend with that today's computer designers did not even have to think about. Okay, so this is the design spec for the Block 2 AGC. You can see here that the word length is 16 bits. It's essentially two bytes. The ROM was 36K. The RAM was 2K. Now, just to put that into context, I did this uh, test a couple of weeks ago. If you open a blank Word document on your computer and save it with no text, that's 12,000 bytes. Three of those took man to the moon and back again. This computer had uh, 34 instructions in its instruction set. Um, it had 29 counters and 5,600 integrated circuits. Just uh, keep those numbers in mind. This is what today's Apple computer has. This is the Apple M1 Ultra chip which is available today. This one single chip has 114 billion transistors, memory speed of 800 gigabits a second. It has 128 gigabytes of RAM. This one chip has 116 CPUs on the chip. At 16 standard CPUs, four high performance CPUs, 64 graphic CPUs, and 32 neural engine CPUs. And the interprocessor bandwidth is two and a half terabits a second. So we've come a fair way since the, uh, the original AGC, just in the last few years. But that gives an indication of how primitive this poor computer was. The choice of a 16-bit word was a careful one. Many scientific computers at the time used 24-bit or longer word lengths, and in general, the longer the word, the better the calculation precision. MIT considered the following factors when deciding on the 16-bit word length. And these are the precision, re precision required for navigation variables, the range of input variables, and the instruction word format. The advantages of a short, shorter word length are simpler circuits for memory management and higher speeds. Greater position could be attained using multiple words. So balancing all the presumed requirements, a 16-bit word seemed optimal. So this is a photo of inside uh, the LEM. And the AGC is almost invisible in this photo. In fact, you can't see the AGC. What you can see is a disky. Now, if you look at the center and near the bottom, you can see four vertical yellow uh, poles, controls. And in the middle, there's a, a box that protrudes down from the control panel. That box is actually the disky or the interface between the uh, AGC and the astronauts. The AGC itself was uh, behind this panel. Now we talk about uh, integrated circuits. 
been used in the AGC and this, the integrated circuits are one of the things that made the AGC possible. So this is an integrated circuit, 1960s style. There's not thousands of components on these integrated circuits. There's between two and eight components, between two and eight components on each integrated circuit. But these were the technologies that helped the AGC exist. So this is the actual AGC itself, um, split in two. Normally these two halves are screwed together. And we saw diagrammatically these two halves uh, a little while ago. So this is an actual AGC split in half to show you each of the modules inside. And then this is a, a close-up of what's known as tray A uh, of the, uh, the AGC. And this photo shows you some of the integrated circuits within the AGC. So this is uh, opening up one of the modules. And I've put a red box around one of the integrated circuits. Uh, so in this uh, picture, there are 60 of the ICs available. And uh, altogether, there are several thousand within each um, AGC. This is uh, an actual photo of magnetic core. Uh, this is one bit per core. And anyone who um, works in the computer industry should be fairly familiar with this fairly archaic but highly important technology. Um, this is where, well, this is the way memory was stored in the old days, one bit per core. Um, now, the AGC took this one step further. Each one of those cores is one bit. But of course, you can't build an AGC uh, with that technology because there's not enough space, not enough room. So they went one step further. They um, used something called rope memory. An unusual feature that contributed to the AGC small size was core rope memory, a technique of physically weaving software into high density storage. The software is built into the hardware. So what you're looking at here is effectively the software programming for the AGC. In the 1960s, most computers, including the AGC, used magnetic core memory for RAM storage, but core ropes were unusual and operated differently. Erasable core memory and core rope both use magnetic cores, which are small magnetizable rings. And here you can see the magnetic rings, those are circles that the wires go through. But while erasable core memory used one core for each bit, core ropes, that's what you're seeing here, stored an incredible 192 bits per core, achieving much higher density. It was to put many wires through each core, hardwiring the data. So what we're doing here, remember, this is the software of the AGC, which is hardwired by stringing the wires through particular cores. A one bit was stored by threading a wire through a core while the wire bypassed the core for a zero bit. There'll be a diagram soon explaining this. Thus, thus once a core rope was carefully manufactured, Using a half mile of wire, the data or the program in this case was permanently stored in the core rope. The chief advantage of the core rope memory design was it could put more information in less space with the disadvantage that it was difficult to manufacture and the contents of the memory, that's to say the software, could not be changed once it left the factory. Core rope memory is a unique data storage device. Each core function, um, uh, each core that you see here, each ring, functions as a miniature transformer and up to 64 wires could be connected to each core or threaded through each core. At a high level, core rope is simple. Sense wires go through cores to indicate ones or bypass the cores to indicate a zero. 
by selecting a particular call, the sense wires uh, th through that call were activated to provide the desired data bits. Magnetic cores have a few properties that make core memory work. By passing a strong current along a wire through the core, the core becomes magnetized either clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on the direction of the current. Normally the cores were all magnetized in one direction called the reset state. And when a core was magnetized the opposite direction, this is called the set state. When a core flips from one state to another, the change in magnetic field induces a small voltage uh, through sense wires, uh, which, uh, go, which go through the core. The sense amplifier detects the signal and produces a binary output. So by having the reset line going through all the cores and various inhibit lines that may or may not go through the cores, cores are the magnetic rings, uh, you can set the zeros and ones and hence the software program. And the key advantage of core rope over the, sing the um, more common single bit uh, cores, as I said before, is that you can store so much more information uh, in the same space. I won't uh, go through uh, all the details of how this works, but uh, it's just important to bear in mind that uh, this technology was core to the success of the AGC, being able to pack so much information in a small space. This is uh, an actual photo of uh, a core memory block from the AGC. And although it's hard to see, each one of those orange circles has many wires going through it. So this, uh, this does raise a little bit of a uh, problem on uh, how to build uh, the AGC, the, uh, the, this uh, core of memory. And we'll see a uh, photo of actually building this uh, in a few minutes. As noted previously, software was a relatively new industry at the time of the Apollo program. Even MIT had limited experience with software. Now, that sounds really strange to say today, um, but software was a new thing uh, back in the early 1960s. The AGC's programs were successfully written partly due to the small team size and dedication of the small team. The final software was completed at T minus 10.5 months, so 10.5 months before launch. The core ropes were completed at T minus four months. So there's very limited uh, gap um, for any errors in the design of the AGC. During the design period, it was decided that the AGC will be responsible for most flight tasks from liftoff to splashdown. All this programming had to fit within the limited memory. The AGC was an interrupt system with multiple programs running in parallel and an executive making sure that the highest priority programs were running in preference to the other programs at any one time. The software is ultimately a binary language, like all programs today. The AGC also had an assembly language, but for programming purposes, MIT created a higher order language to make programming quicker and easier. This is the same structure we use in computers today. Thank the AGC. Using subroutines within the interpreter, the inbuilt 11 instructions of the AGC were expanded to 128 functions needed for navigation and other purposes. The AGC was able to identify issues and automatically initiate restarts. As a computer really could not restart during a, a rocket burn, the AGC also had a method to stay up at all times. Restarts could be initiated if there were voltage failures, a clock failure, where the AGC got caught in an interrupt cycle, an sort of infinite loop, or a signal from the night watchman program, which continually monitored to see if the executive is properly initiating new tasks. So within the AGC, there were programs that, was, that were monitoring the, the AGC to make sure it was performing properly. In the 1960s, a common practice for a computer that was used by several people 
or ran multiple programs was time sharing. In this, the computer will allocate microseconds of time to each task and switch bet between them. This might have been fine for a university mainframe, but for Apollo, it could have been fatal because the computer might end up preoccupied with trivia in a life or death situation or could crash uh, in a manner all too familiar to computer users today. This is when a computer pro uh, pioneer called Halcom Lanning came up with a solution. Instead of time sharing, the AGC was programmed for priority. In other words, each program was numbered in order of importance at any particular point uh, in the mission timeline. If a higher priority program uh, needed the computer, the others would simply stop and wait for it to finish, then resume. Meanwhile, the temporary memory held the data uh, up to the point of stoppage in a way similar to that of modern computers going into a deep sleep mode. This not only eliminated crashes, but also allowed the crew to interrupt a running program with new data as it came in. Since the AGC had to operate a quarter of a million miles from the nearest repair shop, reliability was a top priority. At one point, there was the suggestion of installing a Jupiter computer aboard the spacecraft, but this was turned down in favour of vigorous and aggressive testing, then hermetically sealing the components to keep out dust and moisture. Margaret Hamilton, 30-year-old director of the Software Engineering Division at MIT, uh, was ultimately responsible for the Apollo onboard flight computer programs. The team needed to invent new programming languages and techniques alongside computer hardware. They pieced together complicated sensor and output systems that needed to operate in the most extreme scenario ever imagined. Hamilton so transformed how software programs developed we still use the phrase she coined to describe the activity, software engineering. While the effort to design and program the AGC was a remarkable and successful challenge, issues raised during the program resulted in NASA improving its overall program management systems. This resulted in the following revised program management requirements within NASA which we now assume to be standard best practice. They are documentation is crucial. Verification must proceed through several levels. Requirements must be clearly defined and carefully managed. Good development plans should be developed and executed. And more programmers or staff do not mean faster development. These are some of the lessons learned while building the AGC. And of course, in the whole uh, Apollo program, similar lessons were learned. Okay, I've included this photo because this gives you an idea of how dramatic the AGC development program was. I said that the, uh, the AGC was developed, designed and developed by MIT. Well, this is a photo of MIT's world, whirlwind computer. This is their little baby. This computer had to be shrunk down to the size of a briefcase to fit within the Apollo mission. That was the task of MIT. One thing to bear in mind when looking at the AGC is that it was both a cutting edge in design and very old fashioned in how it was built, both of which presented their own challenges. Unlike modern computers, the AGCs were all handmade in a slow, laborious process that even partial automation, uh, automation and new testing methods did little to speed up or make easier. In all, it took 2,000 man years to build the computers. One difficulty was that the AGC incorporated a lot of cutting edge technology, such as being the first computer to rely on chip components for its logic circuitry, specifically a three input NOR gate, NOR gate. These were just coming on the market, but by 1963, the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory, where the AGC was built, was buying 60% of the chip production of the United States, 60%. 
To build these rote memories, MIT used what they dubbed the LOL method for little old ladies. This was because the programming was done by ex-textile workers who skillfully sent wire-carrying needles through the iron rings. The people who hand-threaded each wire individually were ladies who had experience with knitting and tapestry and who had extreme levels of patience. Grandmothers were in demand in the Apollo project. Other skilled women came from the uh, Walton Watch Company, a company that also helped with the high position gyroscopes used in the Apollo missions. So this is literally building the high tech AGC computer that took man to the moon. They were also aided by automated systems that showed them which hole in the uh, workpiece to insert the needle but it was still a highly skilled job that required concentration and patience. The executive. With the requirement for so many simultaneous operations, how does a single processor computer perform them? The magic of running several programs at once or multi-programming exploits the combination of computer speed the relative slowness of human perception and the reality that not all processing is so time critical then it cannot be interrupted. Unlike a 21st century uh, general purpose computer, the AGC had the huge advantage of operating in a tightly defined world of hardware and software. The rules were well understood and rigidly enforced and reliability was assured through rigorous testing. All resources required by the software were anticipated during development and were available when program execution began. External hardware comprised a few basic uh, device types, uh, all of which used very few instructions for interaction with the AGC. The software system to manage all this was called the executive. This was the heart of the AGC. It provided capabilities capabilities that were advanced even by modern computer standards, especially in light of the limited amount of hardware available. The major uh, services provided by the executive were job initiation, termination and scheduling, memory allocation, restarts and error recovery, the uh, DISCI, the interpretive language and its virtual machine, event timing and input output functions. The AGC was especially notable in its ability to effectively manage the programs running in the computer and its sophisticated restart and recovery design. Now, a lot of this to uh, computer programs today would be very ho-hum, but remember we're talking about the 1960s. These capabilities did not exist uh, before the AGC, Lar largely did not exist before the AGC. So the interpreter, uh, for programmers, a high level program is preferable, but their relatively inefficient code and excessive memory requirements will be impractical on the AGC. The AGC's resource constraints were so severe that only hand coded and optimized programs are practical. The obvious need uh, to extend the AGC architecture and the uh, inability to do so forced the designers to consider their radical departure from evolutionary steps at the time. If extending the hardware is impractical, the alternative is to design an entirely new system architecture and implement it in software. And you can see some of the things that this new software was able to do. Now I'll just skip through a couple of slides to the, um, the DISCI. This is the interface between the astronauts and the AGC. Uh, the most important component of the inputs for the AGC was the, the DISCI unit, uh, with which the astronauts communicated with the computer. The DISCI user interface was so bulky that many people see it today think that this is actually the AGC, where it's just the interface between the astronauts uh, and the, uh, the AGC. Now, if you look at this picture, you can see on the, uh, the right-hand side uh, a numeric display. 
which displays the program number. There were some, I think, 65 programs, uh, main programs in the AGC. And uh, what you can see now is program number 13 um, running. Uh, and I mentioned before the verb and noun pro uh, method for communicating with the AGC. So this is uh, verb 33 and noun 13 in display at the moment. Uh, this would be like um, if you wanted to uh, display the gimbal angle or load a star number, you would uh, input uh, the verb and the noun to do that. And then the bottom three lines, uh, uh, the, uh, the numbers that relate to the program that's running at the moment. And this could be uh, uh, specifications of the star number that uh, you've requested. It could be the estimated time to, uh, to landing. It could be the distance to the uh, touchdown point on the moon, uh, whatever is relevant to the other program that's running uh, at the moment. So what did the uh, AGC do during the, um, uh, the Apollo program? Well, it uh, controlled the Earth to Moon translunar corrections. It did lunar orbit entry, the command module orbital calculations and control, the lunar module landing and takeoff, the lunar mo module abort process if necessary, the redocking procedure in lunar orbit, the Moon to Earth flight guidance and control, and Earth's re entry maneuvers. All of that and more was within that very limited RAM and ROM memory that I mentioned previously. All of these capabilities were under the control of the AGC. So just as I wind up my talk, let's go through, um, I think I'll go through the landing rather than the uh, takeoff, because I'm running out of time. So with the Earth re-entry, this um, photo that I've taken from a, a book, so apologies for the bent shape of the chart, it's, uh, it's come from a book. Uh, this is a diagrammatic of the uh, re-entry to, um, uh, to Earth. So you can see that the, uh, the Apollo mission is approaching Earth's atmosphere uh, typically, it will bump off the, uh, the top of Earth's atmosphere uh, and then make a second approach, final approach uh, to the Pacific Ocean uh, and land uh, in the ocean. So let's just go through this, uh, this process of Earth re-entry. And remember, the AGC is control of this all the way through. For Earth re-entry, we have a number, uh, a, a set of unique problems. Entry back to Earth is the most dynamic series of events. Entry requires transition from vacuum to atmospheric flight, sometimes twice during re-entry, with a vehicle whose flight characteristics change substantially over just a few minutes. During re-entry, the tremendous velocity accumulated in the journey home is converted back into heat. Returning from a lunar mission creates the most dynamic entry profile and a complex sequence of events, but also serves to demonstrate the capabilities of the AGC. The most important goal of the re-entry software is to ensure that the spacecraft will be decelerated to less than 7,700 metres per second, because this will ensure that it cannot remain in orbit around the Earth and come uh, back to Earth. The second goal is to make sure that the spacecraft is guided safely to the splashdown, zo splashdown zone. Deceleration begins quickly as the spacecraft slams into the upper fringes of the atmosphere. From this point, the AGC is tasked with steering the spacecraft towards the targeted splash splashdown point, where it performs the tasks necessary to slow the vehicle. If necessary, the AGC will reverse the downward trajectory and fly back towards space. That's the bump back up again, you can see in the chart. This maneuver is required if the AGC needs to stretch the re-entry by adjusting the flight path to direct itself towards a recovery zone. The AGC, the entry um, uh, monitor system, the stabilization and control system, the inertial measurement unit, the digital autopilot, and other systems are monitoring, acting, and talking to each other during descent. 
And this continues until the parachutes are deployed. And even while the parachutes are deployed, the AGC is monitoring the final stage of uh, the landing uh, of splashdown in the ocean. So the AGC is either monitoring or in control of everything from the time the umbilical cord falls away from the Saturn V at launch until the parachutes are deployed and after on the splashdown to Earth. Okay, just concluding, what makes uh, the AGC uh, an incredible? While the AGC was designed and built during a period of rapid technology developments, it would not be incorrect to say the AGC was the forefront of integrated circuits, miniaturization, human interface design for a particular user, that's the DISCI, programs hard coded in ROM, executive programming controlling other programs, multiple programs running at the same time with prioritization, subroutines for repetitive tasks, self detection of internal or uh, external error conditions with the ability to reset where necessary, ability to reset and then continue from a given point, manufacturing excellence, assembly language creation, which made programming easier than uh, using binary language, the CPU concept, but still separate components, and also it heralded the uh, dawn of the fly-by-wire concept i.e. computer control, which is used today in all aircraft and modern cars. So that's what the AGC did, and we still live by a lot of those uh, technologies and capabilities that were created for the AGC. And the AGC never made a mistake. Okay. Well, uh, that's it. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope that uh, that speech, that presentation was enjoyable. Thanks very much, Scott. Did you want to um, do that video first or do we want to do the questions? Uh, look, I'm easy either way. If there are some questions, and please don't make them too technical, I'm happy to do that. There is a, a what's a 10 or 15 minute uh, video uh, that Wayne's going to show uh, after this. Might take some questions now and then we'll put the video on last. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes. Okay, so uh, questions for Scott. Okay, do you pipe? Okay, does anybody speak directly? Actually, I was going to make a comment about you realize looking at the presentation, Scott, how important that computer was. Some of the technologies mm. with working computers for a living and that they basically were developed as a consequence of it. You know, it was so important looking at the, the actual project and it must have accelerated things by five or six years looking at it. Well, there was, uh, I, I did mention that the, um, the work in building the AGC uh, inspired or led to a lot of very basic management control processes uh, and documentation that we use today in everything. Another thing that um, the Department of Defence and NASA did was literally inspired the computer revolution because they were actually buying most of the integrated circuits that were produced in the United States. And because the AGC had to operate flawlessly in space, there was no technician to you know, desolder an IC and put a new IC in, that they insisted on superbly excellent manufacturing um, processes by Raytheon. So uh, that led to uh, new design concepts within the hardware uh, industry in the United States uh, and the absolute uh, requirement for uh, almost perfect manufacturing. Because what was initially coming out when NASA first saw the integrated circuits was rubbish. Um, and they forced, in the Department of Defense, force Raytheon to uh, in improve its manufacturing processes uh, and then funded the development of integrated circuits to the next level.
Yeah, some of the concepts that you covered in the talk, specifically things like subroutines, mm -hmm. functions, languages, and all that type of stuff, those concepts were actually invented basically to build that computer. That's, that's right. That's how important it was in terms of forcing the, uh, the issue. Was I, I'm a product of probably learning computers back in the 70s, late 70s, when I went through university, and I realised that um, looking at what was going on, we, we were doing punch cards back in those days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> computers around but the thing is mm. that, um uh they were still considered to be large but mm. obviously they were to miniaturize this thing down in such a size that you could put it in a couple of, like a suitcase was a big deal mm. so um got a couple of questions there wayne yeah i got a question wayne yep so scott um when armstrong had to take over manually on on descent was that an issue with the AGC or was it just simply a matter of just ignoring what it was saying? Uh, okay, look, I'll, I'll go through very quickly two apparent problems in the Apollo programs. One was Apollo 11 and one was Apollo 14. I'll start with Apollo 14, if you don't mind, because I went through like half of the story uh, in my speech. There was a bit of, essentially a bit of solder rattling around inside the AGC and they were very concerned that it would, it would touch a couple of uh, contacts uh, in an important part of the landing, and uh, the AGC would then initiate an abort condition and go back to the command module before the Apollo 14 landed. So they, they did an interesting thing to get around that. I mean, that's not a software problem. That was just a little bit of a fault in manufacturing. So what they did was they put the AGC into abort mode. And you go, oh, well, that's a bit of a silly thing to do because it'll go straight back into uh, to the command module again. They put into abort mode and then they reprogram the AGC, the astronauts reprogram the AGC to ignore the abort mode. Now, the hope there was there wouldn't actually be a problem in landing because you just told the system to ignore the abort mode. So you, you set up the error system and you tell it to ignore the, the error system. So that's the way they got around that problem in Apollo 14. Apollo 11, a different problem. Um, when the uh, when the lunar module was landing on the moon, the AGC would normally be operating at 85% of its capacity. So there's plenty of capacity there for it to do all of the calculations and land on the moon. Unfortunately, someone left on the ranging radar between the lunar module and the command module, and that's used to get back to the command module so you know where the command module is but someone left the switch on and that radar was operating. Now, unfortunately, that radar consumes 15% of the capacity of the AGC. So 85 and 15 is 100%. The AGC was running at 100% capacity. So that's what the 1202 error says. I've got no memory. I've got no memory. I've got no memory. Um, very luckily, um, I can't remember the name of the guy, but I think he's on the, uh, the video we'll see soon. Uh, it was a young 26-year-old programmer. Steve Bales. Yeah. yeah. And um, he That's and the uh, mission control said, we think we know what the problem is. Just ignore it and keep going. Um, and luckily, uh, they were right. It wasn't really a problem. And it's just that it was hitting 100% capacity um, in the calculation. So that's the way they got around that one. Someone left a switch on the, uh, the ranging radar. And no one's owned up to that yet, as far as I know. You mean out of the two astronauts? Out of the two astronauts, astronauts. yes, yes. Yeah, There's one or the other. I understand it was Buzz, but... Um, it wouldn't be I Buzz. I, no, Buzz would never do that, of course. But we, we can work out from what was going on that it had to have been Aldrin, because Armstrong, I don't believe, could have done it based on the fact that he wasn't supposed to touch it. Mm. Um, the other thing, there was certain things that the lander module pilot would do and other things that, the, that the, um, the commander would do in terms of the piloting. And the lunar, the lunar module pilot was mainly in charge of the computer systems, all right, So uh, and the, and the uh, radar. So um, you can think about what was going on, even though nobody would own up to it as to who did it. Yeah. So um, that's right. Uh, I also think there was some mistakes with the calculations anyway, because from what I recall, that Armstrong had to take control, but it was partly because there was some misunderstandings about what what the um data on that landing site was 
So it wasn't necessarily a computer's fault. It was um, in, incorrect information that the, um, the computer had been given about the landing site. Now, I think the problem there was uh, when they were landing and had a good visual look at it, uh, there were too many rocks to land. So they had to find a, a clear spot. Yeah, that's that's right. And that's why Armstrong decided that the site that they'd picked in the first place wasn't safe. Yeah. He, he realised that. And that comes down to, to the data that you're actually looking or originally when they did the site, somebody may have made a slight mistake with the where the rocks were. And yeah, they've got. Or the, maybe they've maybe got, they didn't have the uh, resolution to uh, to see the rocks uh, before they actually landed. Well, if you look at the, um, the things that we can do with the Mars cameras now, for example, compared to what was going back in the the nineteen sixty, I'm hardly surprised that they they didn't get everything right with the reconnaissance mm. missions and the photography of it. We've come we've come a thousand fold now in terms of the quality of the the photographs that it can take. So that's the other thing to note. Um, so I think it's one of those things in terms of the level of detail that the, certainly you've done, done the research on. I was quite impressed by um, what we've been able to find out about it and how important it was because um, it, in many ways it would have been a little bit under, under, um, underspoken in terms of how important it was and for what its role was, really. How, how yeah, this is um, the, the technology I talked about then, um, eventually all of those technologies would have come about. Um, but this is one of those situations where massive government investment uh, accelerated the development by, you know, who knows, 10 years, whatever it might have been. Probably 10. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing to note about it. Okay, so we didn't have any further questions. Uh, I think John had one. Okay, I can't see. Oh, 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 just a quick one, Scott. In the development process, did they use the concept of red teams, where they had the sort of in, uh, distinctly different parallel development, just to verify that the work that the work was proceeding? I know that in defence, they quite often do that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what I can say is, in all of the reading that I've done, and I've read all of the. Um, traditional, so all of the books that are written by people of the time, uh, I've read, uh, and there was nothing in there that mentioned that. So I can't say definitively yeah. one way or another, but it hasn't been written anywhere. Yeah, okay, thanks. thanks. Yeah. The concept might have come about later in terms of software. Yeah, maybe so, yeah. Is the AGC used on any other missions by NASA? Uh, I mentioned a couple of the missions. It was used in the uh, Apollo Soyuz. Or all man um, it was used in the uh, some of the um, Air Force jets. Mm. It was used in a naval naval deep sea uh, rescue submarine, um, and I think that's it. So it, it was used in all of the Apollo missions and those extra post Apollo missions. But don't forget, by the time we got to the um, post Apollo missions, the technology was really very antiquated and computer technology developed very, very quickly. But even though it was antiquated, it was still highly functional. Yeah, for aircraft, I think that would have been something that would be useful. Even today, the technology in aircraft can be a little bit behind, hmm. at least if you're looking at, say, third generation um, fighters versus fifth generation, which is the latest ones, and all the problems that they're having with fifth generation fighters compared to third generation, but that's still, that's got quite old computer technology in it really, but. Um, well, that's, it's, it's actually an interesting problem. Um, if you are operating at the, the leading edge of technology, it doesn't matter where you are, you're gonna have failures. You're gonna write off lots of money. So if you've got a, a mission critical device, whether it be an aircraft or whatever, do you really want the thing to fail halfway through the mission or do you use older technology, which is robust and you know it works? Let someone else fail. Let someone else fall out of the sky. Uh, you just have a mission that works. So it's, it's an interesting trade-off. A lot of the current um, technology on the Perseverance rover uh, goes back quite some years for, for that very reason. It's robust. Mm. That's I, right. That's right. I think they were looking at the, those two rovers. I think the, the later one had the newer technology compared to the previous one, but we're still looking sure. at stuff that's probably 10 years old, Alan. That's right. Yeah. And, um, the chips are actually 
much more robust in terms of radiation. That's the thing they want. It's, I know you were talking about the, the latest M1 ultra, ultra computer, and that's, a, that's a, an amazing chip. But the thing is that it's so small now, there's probably concerns about uh, how it will respond in high radiation environment. So that's one of the big problems with taking it into space, that things work well on Earth. But then when we start getting them, although I know that they have got much more experience with laptops now, they are taking the... Um, you know, they're, they're taking laptops up to the ISS and then keeping them up there to see what type of problems they have. So mm -hmm. they're getting a lot more experience with understanding what, what can go up there now, but originally there was too big a risk. And the thing about laptops is at least if something goes wrong with them, <laughs> it's not necessarily the, the, the space station itself that's affected, it's what it was being used for. But the thing is they can always bring them back and swap them over, and, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. something that's stuck in the it's it's built into a box that you can't get at in, in a mission like that so